Hello everyone, and welcome to Resurrection Lutheran Church on this second Sunday after Christmas. May our worship today be glorifying to God and a blessing to you. Amen. We begin in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. We now pause for a moment to reflect on our sins and the forgiveness we're promised in Jesus. Let us then confess our sins to God our Father. Most merciful God, we confess that we are by nature sinful and unclean. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We justly deserve your present and eternal punishment. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us, forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. Almighty God, in his mercy, has given his Son to die for you, and for his sake forgives you all your sins. As a called and ordained servant of Christ, and by his authority, I therefore forgive you all of your sins, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you, and also with you. Majestic is your name in all the earth. You have set your glory above the heavens. Out of the mouth of babes and infants, you have established strength because of your foes to still the enemy and the avenger. Oh Lord, our oh Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. Who are we to be crowned worthy of your word? at your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have set in place. What is man that you are mindful of him, and the son of man that you care for him? Yet you have made him a little lower than the heavenly beings, and crowned him with glory and honor. O oh Lord, our oh Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. Who are we to be crowned worthy of your word? given him dominion over the works of your hands. You have put all things under his feet, all sheep and oxen, and also the beasts of the field, the birds of the heavens, and the fish of the sea, whatever passes along the paths of the seas. O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. Who are we to be ground worthy of your word? The Holy Gospel according to St. Luke, the second chapter. His parents went to Jerusalem every year at the feast of the Passover, and when he was twelve years old, they went up to Jerusalem according to the custom of the feast. When they had finished the days, as they returned, the boy Jesus lingered behind in Jerusalem, and Joseph and his mother did not know it. But supposing him to have been in the company, they went a day's journey and sought him among their relatives and acquaintances. So when they did not find him, they returned to Jerusalem, seeking him. 
Now so it was that after three days they found him in the temple, sitting in the midst of the teachers, both listening to them and asking them questions. And all who heard him were astonished at his understanding and answers. So when they saw him, they were amazed. And his mother said to him, Son, why have you done this to us? Look, your father and I have sought you anxiously. And he said to them, Why did you seek me? Did you not know that I must be about my father's business? But they did not understand the statement which he spoke to them. Then he went down with them and came to Nazareth and was subject to them. But his mother kept all these things in her heart. And Jesus increased in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and men. This is the Gospel of our Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Grace, mercy, and peace be to you from God the Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Our text for today's message comes from Luke chapter 2, as just read. Happy New Year, everyone! This morning, we will be concluding the Christmas season by examining the work our Savior was born to accomplish. In his own words from our lesson, his Father's business. Primarily the tasks of guidance, obedience, and deliverance. So without further delay, let's get down to business. To many in our world today, the historical person Jesus is most typically and sometimes only thought of as a spiritual guide or teacher. And though helpful life advice and wise spiritual guidance are certainly not all that our Lord Jesus offers, as we'll see later, the Son of God was indeed the world's best guide, teacher, and leader. And even to this day, he is still about his Father's business, through the guidance of his Word and Spirit, working the knowledge of faith in our lives. And in our lesson, we get to witness a very early example of this happening, as we find the twelve-year-old Jesus in the temple at Jerusalem, displaying his wisdom as his heavenly Father's child. As it says in verses 46 through 47, Now so it was that after three days they found him in the temple, sitting in the midst of the teachers, both listening to them and asking them questions. And all who heard him were astonished at his understanding and answers. Furthermore, in verse 52, it says, And Jesus increased in wisdom and stature, and in favor with God and men. Well, it's no wonder they were astonished at his understanding and answers. For who better to offer wisdom on the Father's commandments and guidance regarding regarding the Torah the written word of God, then Jesus, the Son, wisdom in person, the living word of God. Even here as an adolescent, though still growing in human knowledge and stature, for in humbling himself and entering flesh, even the word had to learn how to read as fully man. Jesus understood the higher things of heaven, shared his wisdom, and boldly spoke publicly as a divine guide in the temple. And teaching the will of God the Father for all of his people was certainly an important part of his ministry here on earth. As Jesus got older, he would continue to faithfully preach and teach the word of God to all who were willing to listen, that all who hear and believe it may repent of their sin, return to the Lord, abide in his word, and be set free from captivity to death. Of course, as we read in our text, even his earthly parents, Mary and Joseph, who knew that Jesus was sent from God in heaven, as it was revealed to them on multiple occasions by divine intervention, were a little confused about Jesus' words and actions in the temple of Jerusalem. As it says in verses 48 through 50, So when they saw him, they were amazed. And his mother said to him, Son, why have you done this to us? Look, your father and I have sought you anxiously. And he said to them, Why did you seek me? Did you not know that I must be about my father's business? But they did not understand the statement which he spoke to them. This would be a reoccurring theme throughout Jesus' ministry, as many would deny his divine genesis, question the authority of his guidance, and deny that he was the Messiah, the Son of God, sent to redeem God's children. And the same is still true of many people today. But we can have certainty that Jesus is the Son of God, and that his guidance does in fact lead to salvation, because the Father himself 
testifies to his commission. As God the Father said of Jesus in Matthew 3.17, when he was baptized in the Jordan, This is my beloved Son, with whom I am well pleased. And again at his transfiguration in Luke 9.35, This is my Son, my chosen one. Listen to him. Jesus was all about his Father's business, and in doing so, he has offered us the greatest guidance. Follow him. Listen to him. As Christ himself says in the Gospel of John, chapter 14, verse 6, I am the way, and the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. So as long as we listen to Jesus, he shall guide us to eternal life. However, Jesus came to earth not only to speak of God's law and love, but to faithfully live it and fulfill the demands that condemn all sinful men unable to keep them, in order that all may be redeemed who believe in the gospel work of Jesus' obedience. As the Son says in Matthew 5.17, Do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. And he did, even from the time of infancy, every last one. As it says in Luke 20, chapter 2, verse 21, And at the end of eight days, when he was circumcised, he was called Jesus, the name given by the angel before he was conceived in the womb. So Jesus' parents were obedient to God's covenant with Abraham from Genesis 17, as well as the law of Moses, as it says in these next verses from Luke 2, 22 through 24. And when the time came for their purification according to the law of Moses, they brought him up to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord and to offer a sacrifice according to what is said in the law of the Lord. And now, at the age of 12, we see Jesus again in the temple at Jerusalem, observing the feast of Passover as commanded in Exodus 12 and Deuteronomy 16. And in the words from our reading from verse 51, then he went down with them, and came to Nazareth, and was subject to them. We see that Jesus was also obedient to his parents, thus keeping the fourth commandment, Honor your father and your mother, from Exodus chapter 20. Finally, Jesus was obedient to the point of sacrificing his own body, that we may be forgiven, the highest responsibility of his father's business. As Jesus prayed in the Garden of Gethsemane before his journey to be crucified on Mount Calvary, Father, not my will, but yours be done. In this greatest act of obedience was foreshadowed in Genesis chapter 22, when Abraham, along with his only son Isaac, embarked on a three-day journey to Mount Moriah for the reason that God had commanded Abraham to sacrifice his firstborn son, his one and only child whom he loved, as an offering to the Lord. What's really amazing is that this land would be the future location for the temple in Jerusalem. Mount Moriah is only mentioned one other time in all of Scripture, as it says in 2 Chronicles 3.1. Then Solomon began to build the house of the Lord in Jerusalem on, on Mount Moriah, where the Lord had appeared to David his father at the place that David had appointed. This means that the near-death experience of Father Abraham's only son Isaac took place in future Jerusalem, on the mount where our Lord would be designate his house, the temple, to be constructed. And for those of us more familiar with New Testament geography, this places Mount Moriah at least in the same vicinity as Mount Calvary, where Jesus Christ, 42 generations later, was put to death and slain for our salvation. Like Isaac, in obedience to his father, carried the bundle of wood placed upon his back, designated for his own sacrifice. The weight of the sins of the world was laid upon Jesus as he carried the heavy cross fashioned for his own execution to bear our iniquities and to make atonement for our sins with his own body and blood. Like the ram with his horns tangled in the thorns on Mount Moriah by Father Abraham, Jesus was sacrificed with a crown of thorns on his head, nailed to the wood of the cross, and sacrificed by God the Father, 
so that we may be spared the very same fate he willingly embraced in our place as the only perfect Passover lamb, the final and eternal offering for the redemption of man, allowing us to become sons and daughters of the Father by grace through faith in the obedient sacrifice of his only begotten Son for our salvation on the Mount of the Lord. As Abraham said in great faith in Genesis 22, 8, God will provide for himself the lamb. And he most certainly did. A ram took the place of Isaac, who was saved on Mount Moriah. Thus, as it says in verse 14, Abraham named that place, the Lord will provide. And sure enough, the lamb who was slain was provided in Jesus, who took the place of us on Mount Calvary. This, the work of the Son, was the will of the Father. And for all of God's children who believe in the word of the Lord, it is the greatest day ever recorded in the history of the Heavenly Father's business. Jesus, in his obedience and sacrifice, checked off absolutely every single task on his Father's list necessary for our salvation, primarily his crucifixion and resurrection. He was successful in every way, and the reward of his most blessed labor of love is us. Everything he did was to honor the divine desire of his heavenly Father, and because of what he achieved through the work of his crucifixion, we have been granted the greatest blessing ever offered, the benefits of his holy business, his divine service, the fulfillment of spiritual deliverance promised in his advent, the forgiveness of sins secured in his birth on earth at Christmas, the assurance of eternal life proclaimed after three days in the grave in his resurrection, and the privilege of being able to call the Lord Jesus not only our Savior, but also our brother. In a word, deliverance. The purpose of his Father's business, in the grandest sense, was indeed to deliver us and save us from death. I believe it's worthy of mentioning that this boy in the temple was not named by his earthly father Joseph, as was usually expected, but rather he was named by his heavenly father, as the angel said to Joseph in Matthew chapter 1 before our Lord's birth. Do not fear to take Mary as your wife, for that which is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. What this means is that the heavenly father gave his son a name worthy of the family business, the same as his job description, the reason he was born, and reminder of what he would accomplish. Jesus, which means the Lord is salvation. The name Jesus perfectly describes who he is, as well as what he does. The Lord saves. He saves us from our sins and wins for us eternal life in him, providing us with his forgiveness, humbly working for our salvation, and assuring our everlasting deliverance from death and hell is what Jesus was born to do, would die to do, and would rise to do. Under his authority, God's will for us was successful. Jesus perfectly lived up to his name, that we may bear it also, for all eternity, as his own. As it says in Romans 8, For God has done what the law, weakened by the flesh, could not do, by sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh, and for sin he condemned sin in the flesh, in order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us. You have received the spirit of adoption as sons, by whom we cry, Abba, Father. We are children of God, and if children, then heirs, heirs of God, and fellow heirs with Christ. From the stable or cave in which he was born, to the garden grave from which he was raised, Jesus came to deliver and save his Father's children with his work of redeeming grace on the cross. God in love has sent his Son. Blood's been shed, our sins are gone. Christ is risen and life has won. Thus we, through faith, shall too live on, for we have been delivered. And so with Christ as our guide and example, we too seek to be gracious and lay down our lives for others, not because our works can save us, but because his saving work on the cross 
moves us to care and compassion, and believing in Him inspires us to humble service. So if we, as God's adopted children, desire to be about our Father's business, we need simply follow the example of His Son, our brother and Savior, Jesus, receiving the strengthening gifts of word and sacrament in honoring His divine service, certainly in worship, as well as in all we say and do, in humble service to Him. Paul's advice in Philippians chapter 2 nicely summarizes how God works faith, guidance, and obedience through His Word to bring about His deliverance in Jesus for even more people, as God's love, Christ's love, shines in us as lights in this world. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, so now, for it is God who works in you, both to will and to work for his good pleasure. As we enter this new year, may we never forsake the holy work our Savior has prepared for us, nor reject the wisdom of his guidance, but pray that he would send his Holy Spirit to help us to be obedient to his word, set our minds on things above, and never forget the mercy of God's deliverance as we live for the Lord and love our neighbors. In faith, may we always be about our Father's business. Though Christmas comes to an end, may we never cease to humbly serve our Savior faithfully and joyfully as Christians in His divine service until we inherit as heirs our Father's kingdom. In the holy name of Jesus, amen. We now join in confessing our faith together by reciting the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, 
suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. If you have not already done so this week, I would like to encourage you to reflect upon your tithes and offerings to the Lord. If you would like to mail in your tithes or offerings, you may do so to the mailing address that is on the screen. If you would like to give your tithes or offerings online, you may do so on our website. Simply go to the website rlc.life and click the Give Online button. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Amen. Go in peace and serve the Lord. Thanks be to God.